We're now going to talk about women artists of the 19th century. We've already talked about a few from the 19th century, but we're going to continue on. First, I want to talk to you a little bit, a little bit about 19th century. Uh, this is a somewhat of a review of some of the things that's in your text. Um, the 19th century, of course, was a great time of change. Uh, we see things like the French Revolution at the end of the 18th century. Um, and then, of course, uh, the revolutionary government gives way to an imperial um, empire and uh, to a monarchy. So uh, we see this, this change going on in France. Uh, Britain had, of course, in the late 18th century, had lost their colony in the New World, uh, what had become the United States. Um, and, but except for that, it was a time of imperial growth. Uh, you've probably heard the phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Uh, in America, it was another era of growth, uh, geographically and economically, uh, as, America, uh, as uh, Americans pushed into the West. Uh, we also see a rise of the middle class. Now, there's many times we see the rise of the middle class. We see this at the end of the Middle Ages and uh, during the Renaissance as the uh, uh, craftsmen and the merchants uh, become more important. But here is another time when you see the rise of the middle class. Um, but also, uh, the Industrial Revolution changes everything. Um, and in some ways, um, you know, we get uh, pollution, uh, we get uh, sometimes uh, even a greater abuse of workers. At other times, it makes possible new kinds of um, production and new jobs. Um, I mean, even things like uh, the invention of the typewriter. At first, they thought only men could do this, and later on, they realized that women could. And of course, then women started getting jobs uh, eventually. Now, one of the things uh, that's really interesting to me is the concept of women is in some ways the same, and in some ways has really changed uh, from. Uh, say the Middle Ages or something of the, of, of the Renaissance, the, they still have that idea that women should be submissive and they should be dainty and they should ha live in the domestic sphere. Uh, they should be charming and beautiful. But an interesting idea that's so different than the Renaissance in the Middle Ages uh, is this idea that women have a moral superiority. I suppose the roots may go back to the Renaissance. Um, in Castiglione's court here, um, Giuliano de' Medici, Il Magnifico, actually is made to say, we don't know if he really said this or not, but uh, he's, he, he becomes the character who says something about women, in some cases being uh, even more virtuous than men, which was something that you just didn't hear. <laughs> Um, but that idea that women, because they uh, were the daughters of Eve, that they were uh, inherently more evil, more sexual, um, less intelligent, and you know, all these things, um, that women had been thought to be morally inferior to men. And, and so now this is, this is an interesting change. Um, now, what goes with this, of course, is uh, still that idea of women's virtue uh, is tied to their sexuality. A chaste woman is virtuous. Uh, a woman uh, who is not chaste, uh, for whatever reason, even if she's raped, uh, even if uh, she's uh, forced into um, sexual relationships because of uh, economic circumstances or whatever, um, that uh, then she's bad. So they, they do have this idea that there's good women and bad women. And a lot of it does go by class. Um, because if a woman can be, you know, kept in the household uh, and watched over as a, a middle class or an upper, upper uh, class woman could be, uh, they were supposed to have a lack of sexuality. And of course, we, we know this the Victorian uh, sensibilities. Uh, then there were the lower class women, uh, the servants in the households, for example, uh, or the women who are uh, of the poorest laboring classes. Um, and many of them, just to, to feed their children, have to, are forced into prostitution. Uh, there's just not a lot of opportunities, either for men or women of that class, but even less for women than for men. 
Um, and in some cases, uh, the servants, um, if a servant got pregnant, she was, she was considered to be evil and fired. You know, she was immoral. Uh, the fact that it might be uh, the male members of the household that uh, coerced her or raped her uh, is of no, you know, it's her fault, she's bad. Uh, so you have that whole idea about the fallen woman. Um, I'm not going to do a lot with that as far as uh, some of the Victorian um, paintings, um, but you can read about that in your text. Now, let's talk about art. In art, um, one of the things that's often said is that women are unoriginal. They follow the styles of, other, of the men. Uh, women, for example, uh, follow, for example, a neoclassical or a realistic style. But let's think, what does that mean? What would that mean to a 19th century woman, or any, any other period, actually? But uh, if a woman started some radical new style, Well, we know that a lot of times when a man started a style, he might have some difficulties, <laughs> but certainly others might flock to it. Um, but what if it was a woman? What, what would happen? Probably she might just be ignored. She might be vilified. He might say, oh, that's so ridiculous, that's so horrible. Um, you know, if they can say it to Cezanne or Van Gogh or anyone else, you know, you could, you could certainly say it to a woman. And then there would be the question of what you have to have, if you're original, you start a new style, you have to have followers. But remember, uh, most of the artists would have been male, uh, although we're going to see there's more and more, as, as time goes on, there's more and more women artists. Um, and, you know, I, it, there are some occasions probably when a male artist follows a woman, but generally they wouldn't be flocking to it because it would have been conceived it would have been considered unmanly if a male were to follow a woman's style or a woman's lead. Um, the idea that you know, men were in charge, of course, was, was, uh, has always been uh, something that, uh, even today, you know, is just something like a, a basic assumption of societies. And you know, it's it also possible if they came up with a radical new style uh, that it might not even be recognized as art. So it was probably a much better strategy for a woman to follow in a style that was already established. And we'll, no, we see this, of course. Uh, another thing that's, that's uh, interesting is that uh, women were very much involved with creative art activity in making things uh, for the home. Um, and for example, um, quilts. Now that's not an upper class activity. You know, that's um, particularly in America, is uh, an activity where you have uh, people who have to work for a living and um, they're, they're utilizing every little scrap of fabric uh, to make something both beautiful and useful. And also you've heard of you know, quilting bees where it becomes a women's social activity, um, particularly in America. Um, up until fairly recently, anything that had utilitarian purpose was not recognized as art. So when you think of all the sort of artistic, uh, creative activities that women have done throughout the millennia, uh, whether it's pottery, whether it's uh, embroidery, uh, whether it's making quilts, um, it's often called craft and not recognized as art. And that's one of the things both men and women have been uh, working on in the 20th century to get certain media, uh, even uh, when it is created as a non-functional item, for example, clay sculpture uh, that uh, has no function, but it's from a material that uh, was traditionally used for utilitarian purposes. So this idea that things that were traditionally recognized as craft we're now thinking of as maybe we can see them as art. One of the things that was very interesting to me when I read that section uh, in your textbook uh, was that there were innovative styles in quilts. Anything from crazy quilts, which basically were you know, what the woman put together, uh, and, and uh, some of them really do look like you know, abstract expressionistic art of, of uh, a century later. Um, but I found this wonderful example here. Um, 
you know, some of them do look like they're cubist works or non-objective works. And this one I thought was really interesting. We have a, a quilt from 1860. And it's a, a style that's called the baby block. And if you look at it, it looks like lots of little blocks. But you can sort of adjust your eye and it looks like uh, lots of little diamonds. And you know, you keep adjusting your eye and seeing different things. Well, this is exactly what they were doing in the 1960s uh, for what they called op art, optical art. And uh, there was such a, when I saw that quilt, uh, uh, picture of the quilt, uh, I said it just reminded me so much of Vasarelli's work. And uh, so this was high art, it's painted uh, in the 1960s, about 100 years later. Uh, and yet certainly uh, the innovation, uh, and even if he didn't know it, came much earlier uh, in uh, a uh, work of art that had not been recognized as art, uh, this uh, baby block quilt. So we have to ask ourselves, what kind of strategies, what kind of strategies for success would women of the 19th century have to follow? Now, they don't all do this, but one of the things you will see is that they often, even if they are in some way eccentric or do things differently than um, the social mores of the time would say, uh, they have to give an appearance of irreproachable conduct. Uh, we'll find, for example, Rosa Bonheur wears uh, trousers when she goes uh, to uh, stockyards and places to, uh, con to, to, to do her, her artwork and to um, do her research, as it were, for her artwork. And uh, she makes a big deal about the fact that uh, that is her working costume. She wears skirts. She wears skirts. She's really a woman. <laughs> um, and in many cases, they had to present themselves with a feminine demeanor. And um, we've seen this in earlier eras. You know, women who are very pretty uh, do have an advantage. Um, frequently, there are styles of art, and the subjects that they choose are conservative. Or if they have some innovation, they may not be recognized as that. And uh, we'll be taking a look at some of these artists and how, even if they are eccentric, you know, how do, how do they um, overcome the criticism? Because there's always criticism. <laughs>